I just went to the town for Start it. There you go. Good morning, everyone. Day is starting rather early and life is beautiful across our great state. You can see the agenda we have in front of us. So we've got a discussion with Esser and just as an understanding of Esser 3, then the last tranche of the federal COVID money um, has its uh, completion September of this coming school year of 2024. Then we've got Kira, and Kira lives in Inverness. She's a great employee. Uh, she is the family engagement specialist. So we're going to have a discussion on the trustee repository, the education savings account, 
Um, and then we have Marie going to be popping. She um, is in Conrad, and she has uh, been discussing early literacy and the targeted intervention program that has come into three different parts. Um, so those house bills will be discussed. And then we've got Marie then continuing to the Summer Institute. Yep, summer is coming. Can hardly wait um, as there's still a dusting of snow, of course, on our mountain ranges across our beautiful state. Katie then is going to be discussing um, a, a gathering of quite a lot of people, 170 of them that um, have come in on a portal and our website from all across our state, many, many different walks of life. <clears throat> and really understanding, first and foremost, what is the budget? Uh, what is the state tax dollar? What is a local tax dollar and a federal tax dollar look to give opportunities to our students? And uh, it's gonna be a working group. They're gonna have multiple uh, Zoom discussions with this. And again, breakouts, of 170 people, but really wanted to get a really strong voice. A paper then will be given, or a document uh, will be given to the legislature before this interim concludes. And then in 2025 <clears throat> interim, there is the Decentennial Funding Commission that the legislature then will look at. I served on the first one in 15, and then 10 years later, of course, in 25 will be that one. Dr. Mergel will be giving an accreditation update, and it's going to be a, a good meeting. Please ask any questions. Um, this is also recorded. Any materials that we do offer will also be given back to you. So with that, Wendy, please go ahead and go. Thank you, Superintendent. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, as all things ESSER are always uh, a very mobile unit, so we're going to kind of jump into the compliances and the place that we are mobilizing our efforts right now are in the compliance and status of the annual reports. I wanted to give a big thank you to all the districts that have, in fact, completed that. Um, we have 23% still to do, about 100 left out of our 400 and roughly 50 entities that completed that in the last two weeks. Um, those of you who may have seen that sometimes described it as a table runner because it's this is very, very long Excel sheet. Um, but OPI did uh, pre-populate it with about 80% of the data and 20% we asked the districts to fill in. So again, a big thank you to all those districts who did that, but also would ask uh, if any of you have any districts who haven't or um, have those conversations, please ask those districts to continue to work on those. Call us. Um, we're available during work sessions, et cetera, to help with that. The um, self-assessment, those monitorings have gone pretty well. We still have a, a under 100 that need to be completed. There are about 17% that aren't complete yet. And the uh, ESSER plans, we're still working on those. Those are still um, out there. Those are plans divided into two categories. One is use of funds posted on all district websites, and then also safe returns. So how do I get back into the building? What do I do in the event that another pandemic hits? Um, and then of course, we're working in the closeout mode. So SR3, as the superintendent noted, uh, is coming to a close in September. So um, unfortunately, just because we've spent all the money doesn't mean we don't have to keep reporting. We will have at least another year to report, if not two. Um, I wanted to kind of show these graphs. It's just a visual. They'll be in the handout indicating how many we still have to complete in each of these groups um, and where they all stand. So you'll have that as a visual as well. We are going to be looking at doing training at the end of this month. Those have gone out to uh, districts. I know that Masbo has been very nice in helping to share that information out as well. And that's really focusing on three areas. It's looking at transitions, compliances, and then just overall planning for the sort of post error of ESSER. So what do I do as I'm losing funds, as I'm losing resources, as I'm losing employees, or how do I continue to keep going those programs and efforts that have been very successful during the COVID um, time frame when we had those funding. So how do I move that, those positions and those programmings into the future? Um, the way that that is playing itself out is there is a four uh, person team. We are asking that a trustee and authorized representative superintendent, business manager or clerk, and some other representative form those teams. 
And then these are the areas, this is the agenda that we'll be focusing on, sort of that school funding 101, the uh, budgeting, those kinds of pieces and planning. We'll be doing grant management, public engagement, community partnership. This community partnership will be a big share. And then sort of wrapping it all together and saying, how do we develop this plan? What do we reflect back on? And how do we move forward? So that's um, where we are in the ESSER mode and, and things that we're doing. And I stand if there are any questions. Okay, thank you. The superintendent um, has um, left, and um, so I am here to help transition us to the next item on the agenda, please. Okay, I believe that is me with House Bill 811. I'm going to share my screen as well. So the trustee elections are happening the first week of May. Um, so we ask that you please remind your clerks as they are the authorized representatives to update the trustee repository. Um, I have the page right here. If you go to the OPI main page, you can click school trustee repository. So anyone can find any information about their school. So it should have their school's name, the website, this information is only updated by the clerks, and when they log into the page, they have access to update this information. And that is it on the trustee repository. If anybody has any questions, you can contact Barbara Quinn. Um, and on to the education savings account. So applications will be available in digital and paper form uh, beginning May 1st, and I will be um, working with Whitney Williams, who is the new finance person we've hired full-time, who's going to be assisting families with the entire application process, um, the eligibility process. She'll be hands-on with that. So we should be going through and starting to test this application process this week. Um, we also have an education savings account family interest survey that's out now. It's listed on the website. So please share that with anyone. Um, we're hoping to collect information and see how many parents are interested or might have additional questions. Um, and then that is pretty much covers the education. I will sh show you. This is our web page for the savings account. So we have some fast links. Right here is the survey. So um, we haven't had a lot of responses come in yet, but we did just put out the um, press release for it yesterday. And then we also have our steering committee and we're working on an ESA handbook that will be helpful to parents. So we had a subcommittee meeting going over the handbook last night and hopefully we'll have the details of that um, finalized by May 1st. And here's the members. So that's all I've got. Thank you, Kara, for that uh, friendly reminder as we start heading into um, election season for trustees, for folks to um, be sure that the clerks go in after the elections and update the repository. And thank you all also for sharing the information about the education savings account um, with the May 1st um, starting point and the location on our webpage with lots of great information about that and knowing that there's going to be even more robust information for our families uh, regarding that is um, good information to share. So thank you so much for that, Kara. And so I'm going to now turn it over to Marie uh, to take us through early literacy targeted intervention. Good morning, everyone. Marie Judish, Senior Manager of Teaching and Learning. And we've brought this here before, so I want to just make sure to give you a brief overview and an update of where we are in our processes for implementation. So a reminder, this House Bill 352 has now been codified as 20-7-1803, and you can see all the information aligned there with what you need to guide your implementation, as well as our robust uh, website that we have been continually taking in feedback, adding more resources and information for districts implementation as we learn more about this and make sure we weed out all the different things so that it is clear as possible for implementation. One of the great things of this project is the collaboration that we've been able to do with the Board of Public Ed as well as districts through the OPI 
uh, Early Literacy Collaborative. So you'll see the balance of projects and how we've worked together to get this into the school's hands. We are now at the point where we actually have districts who are doing their screenings and calling us all excited about, oh, all the kids we screened today qualified. So we get to have 14 little four-year-olds in our building. And it's just fun to hear that other side of it and get to that implement implementation phase. So it's nice to see that all this hard work and preparing for it's starting to get going. With that, I wanted to show you what our uh, website latest update is. You'll see all of these links on the right-hand side that show the helpful resources. Initially, it's a great way to bring to your school board to make sure they understand or sharing these things with parents so they know how to request for their child to be screened for early literacy targeted interventions. You'll also see we will soon have uh, the content standards that were updated by the Board of Public Ed Early Literacy Advisory Council in Title 10, Chapter 63 were updated, and I believe they'll be in ARM here very soon. We've been updating the frequently asked questions to make sure that the more questions we get with a repeated theme, we have those answers to help support districts. We've also uploaded a few uh, letter templates for you just to make it easier or for districts to make it easier to connect with families, have that clear language. And then down below, you'll see that we've established early literacy office hours. We are hosting those almost every Wednesday before and after school times, and we're getting more and more attendance on there for our districts that are excited about uh, bringing this to their families. In progress right now, we are finalizing our data collection tools, including how it will go into Infinite Campus or AIM, as well as how we will collect the information on the efficacy of these programs so that we can use that to then report to legislation on how this, these programs are going. The guidance documents, like I said, are continually going to be uploaded. And our next step now that we're getting these things checked off is to make sure that we have some guidelines for best practices for the classroom base, as well as the Jumpstart programs. This week, we will begin scoring the RFP for the home-based learning program, which will be presented for the Board of Public Ed selection at their May meeting. And again, continued communication. Not only have we established the office hours, but we're getting out in the field. We were, I was able to sit on a panel for the Early Childhood Education Institute a few weeks ago, which brought on a lot more questions and a lot more partners that hadn't heard all the details. I just have a quick draft up here of what the infinite campus schedule will look like for that data collection component, what it means for districts. So it's really clear on the responsibilities that are have to be met through AIM, just to make sure that they have the timelines, all the calendar, um, all those pieces in there, particularly for the Jumpstart programming, making sure we hit the 120 hours in a minimum of four weeks this coming summer. Another glimpse of our data collection tool, and this is more on the efficacy component, making sure we know what the tools uh, that are being used for the evaluation methodology are and collecting that information, and then continued information about how they determine uh, eligibility as well as the formative assessments and pieces so that districts get to tell the story of growth for their students in these programs. And with that, um, if you have questions about this, here's the main team for those questions. Jackie Ronning is our early literacy coordinator. Kimberly Evans is our early literacy research analyst, and then myself. Um, and we also have Julie Mergel, of course, and Christy Mockstutz, who have been helping support this implementation. And with that, I'm done with it. Are there any questions on the early literacy um, interventions component? Hi, Marie. This is Trish Schreiber. I do have a question. I actually have two questions. One, I'm wondering if you guys have heard of any interest of any families using the home-based program. We have not at this point. We have had districts indicate that they would like to enroll in that. And so once they have all their screening completed, we're going to have that rollout on July 1st when the program comes into play so that we can start assigning licenses for whomever is awarded the vendor. And we'll work out all those logistics once we know who will be providing those pieces. Does that help answer your question? It does. I'm wondering if there have been um, sort of like you had showed with the ESA that you guys have a parent survey. I'm wondering if you guys are doing any outreach for parent survey for that home-based program. You know, that's a great question. Uh, we can look into that. I will say that it is still determined on the district eligibility component. So the district does have to opt into offering the home-based learning. So part of that goes back to how the districts are communicating, but that's a great oh, question. Okay. So yeah. if the districts want to do, if they opt in and you happen to live in those district zone lines as a homeschooler, then you could, or any family, you could then look at the home-based program. Is that correct? It does have to be screened at the district level and so to make sure that they are eligible. So that's a great way, even if there's a homeschool family, if they want to communicate with their districts to see how they can utilize that program. That's what I recommend right now. And I'll dig into that survey. That's a great idea. 
Awesome. Thank you. My second question was, um, you know, during the interim committees, there was a lot of discussion about the initial funding in 24. I'm wondering if you guys were able to settle that. Uh, can you explain a little bit further about your question? What do you mean by funding? Well, 20? it's like the program be begins on July 1st, but in order mm -hmm. for the schools to do the required hours, they were going to need to start in June. And so there was a question about that. Yep. Go ahead. Yep. Trish, I don't think this is Julie. Um, that has not quite been resolved yet. Um, just so that you know, um, I think there's been ongoing conversations. Um, I think some information um, will be further coming, but um, as of right now, I have not had any um, further indication at this point that funding begins um, until July one. Okay, thank you. Just I to think keep we need to on the ball. Yep. Yep. And I, I would anticipate, um, just so you know, more communication probably coming out about that in the next few weeks, um, because summer is is approaching us quicker than maybe we're ready for. Thank you. You bet. Perfect. Are there and, any other? Yeah. Yep. Marie, this is McCall. I just wanted to let folks on the call today know that um, those standards were all updated and published on April 12th. So you can oh, go perfect. and find them in chapter 54, which outline, um, as you know, those sort of skills and the requirements for um, the uh, assessments. And then chapter 63 is the revisions to the early childhood education standards. Perfect. We will update all those links so that it's right on that website. Thank you for that, McCall. All right, are there any other questions about early literacy? If not, I believe I'm also the next section, so we will get going with that component. I am covering for Tammy license today as she's part of our accreditation team and doing all those reviews. Um, like the superintendent said, it is hard to believe that we are here thinking about Summer Institute. Um, You'll see a general overview of the Summer Institute schedule. This year we are going Monday through Thursday, and it is once again at Montana State University taking over their campus like teachers have for many, many summers now. Um, as you go across the top, you'll see the different initiatives for the agency listed, the Hope, Learn, Ready, and Teach, and really Tammy did a great job coordinating these themes throughout the week and making sure that we're focused on all the different agency initiatives. Well, our first keynote speaker on Monday is, oh, it moved on me, sorry. Let me go back there. Dr. Randy Russell, who is focused on our hope and the three ships, relationships, leadership, and partnerships. Our next one is Tuesday, where we have Dr. Jill Bowler coming in. She's the author of several books, but including Limitless Mind and Mathematical Mindsets. And she'll be there with us Tuesday, not only for the keynote, but she has some follow-up sessions as well. Then we have Mary Ann Moran and John Clements, who will be speaking on the Montana's graduate profile. I can say I've been a, an attendance of most of these presenters already for different attendees. So we're really excited that we are bringing in some dynamic uh, speakers for our educators to experience. And then on Wednesday, we also we have featured speaker, Dr. Zelvine Smith-Dixon, who is focused on special education inclusive leadership, the heart of the matter, really bringing in that component for our special ed educators and also general ed classroom educators. If you want to see the full schedule and also the live registration, it is up and ready on the OPI website. Uh, I can drop this link here when I'm done sharing so that you can make sure to share it out with your different components, whether no matter where you serve. And it's also open for other people to come in and participate. There's lots of wonderful learning that will be happening during those June days. Again, that's June 17th through 20th. And we hope that many of you could join us there. Um, if you do have questions about it further, please contact Tammy License, who is the CETA, oh, sorry, acronym, CETA unit manager at that email. And you'll also be getting the slideshow when we're done here today. So you'll have all this information as well. With that, are there any questions I can help answer for the Summer Institute? All right. All right. Thank you, Marie, for all the information on the Early Literacy and the Summer Institute. We're now going to turn it over to Katie uh, to talk to us a little bit about the uh, budget uh, think tanks and stakeholder groups that are coming together. So, Katie, over to you. Hi. Um, so I went ahead and uh, shared my screen here. So this is the OPI's homepage and the superintendent did a great job of kind of doing an overview of what the budget and the education working group is. But if you're looking for more information, our homepage, there's a button right here. 
Um, like she mentioned, we had over 170 individuals that uh, wanted to participate. We're breaking those down into seven smaller groups, which are listed here. And this is based on the interest and comments that people put in when they were applying. And then all the information for the small groups is on here. So if people wanna join and just listen in and watch, we'll also be posting the record, the recorded meetings online. And then if you scroll all the way down, you can actually see how, um, how great the participation is. We really do have people from across the straight, uh, state. We have 38 counties participating. So um, I think it should be a really great discussion. Um, and after we kind of go through all that, each small group will have three meetings. We'll be putting together a white paper and presenting that to the legislature um, in September. Um, if anyone has any questions, happy to take any at this moment. Thank you, Katie. I don't hear any questions. And so we're on our last agenda item, which is on accreditation. Um, Marie and I are hailing today from Accreditation Scoring Central, if you will. We have um, over 54 people here working very intensely on calibrating the scores for all the accreditation submissions that were due on March 29th. And so it has been um, a year of coaching and learning around our accreditation process, which has really um, changed quite a bit. And so um, it's really exciting to see um, all of the different evidence that school districts are submitting. We are seeing evidence of some, you know, incredible work out there in the field around family and community engagement, integration of EFA, and just really like some pieces around um, the, the data that they're utilizing to really support the learning and outcomes that are happening for our students in our schools. So we have been um, huddled here now for uh, this is our second day and just had really put together a lot of information around calibrating and being sure that we have some reliability and really sticking to a rubric that was shared with our districts um, up front. Uh, so it has been um, a lot of information. Um, we'll take all of those scores that are going into our accreditation platform and be getting the final overall um, information, if you will, of schools ratings. Um, and that will be going to the board in July. And so that's kind of where we're at right now. And we have a think tank on, um, on Thursday, the 18th, where we're talking with some of our stakeholders and our principals and superintendents around what do we really want year two to look like? Because this year we kind of stepped into it. It's been a year of learning, but we're just kind of trying to further understand kind of where we're at. And so that's been important. And so you can see here on our website, this is the timeline we're on leading up to our July um, and we are on target to meet that date. So we're very excited about that. And then uh, we are meeting on, like I said, Thursday to just kind of continue the process um, with our school districts around the think tank of what that might look like. So lots of great information here on the website about the details, about our timeline, um, just kind of what's happening there. Um, and certainly as well, just even, um, let me click out of there. Um, oops, sorry, you guys. Um, so uh, anyhow, there's information on there if you want to see the rubrics of what we're scoring, how we're scoring, um, and all of those pieces are available on that website. But we're just really deep in right now scoring. So um, that's exciting. And like I said, um, I think we're getting a lot of um, information and we are going to be providing really specific targeted feedback um, to uh, all of our school districts. So I think that'll be the first time where they just don't get, this is your rating, but they're going to get a lot more information. And we're building out um, within the tool. Um, we're not quite there yet, but um, as we're continuing in the phases, we will be. Um, uh, we'll get there this summer, but there's going to be dashboards so that anybody at any point in time can go in and look in much more detail about how a school did, how a district did, and what are those areas and where they scored, and um, just some of that feedback. So um, I think it's gonna become much more transparent and a lot more information available to our school districts. So we're very thankful for a lot of that upgrade, if you will, of the tools so that our schools get that information and actually get some feedback on how they can continue to improve. So that is all that I have, unless anyone has any questions about accreditation.
Okay, any questions other than the topics that we discussed today before we close out? All right, um, Brian will follow up with an email to everybody with links to the PowerPoints that were shared today. We thank you all for joining us and we look forward to seeing you in, a, in um, May for our next session. Thanks.